Good evening and welcome to a special edition of the Daily Friend Show. I am your host uh, this evening, uh, Gabriel Krauser. I've got Nicholas Lorimer, the usual host, playing Magical Magician in the production box backstage. And uh, uh, a South African uh, who needs no introduction, uh, Helen Ziller, is our esteemed guest for this evening. Hi, Helen, and thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Gabriel. It's great to be with you all again. So here we are to talk about uh, essentially an assault on South African voters and the democratic process, uh, which just strikes me as something I never quite thought that I would uh, live through, uh, it being that I was born uh, after the, the bad old days. Um, has I mean, just before we lay out the details, like, I, I, have you been surprised uh, at, at at the at the at the way that this election of uh, municipal government in 2021 uh, has played out so far this election cycle? Well, nothing surprises me anymore, uh, Gabriel. I'm inured to surprise. A lot of things sadden me still, and a lot of things bother me, but surprise is perhaps not the right word. I didn't think I would live to see a day when the ANC would so consciously plan not to have an election when it didn't suit them, and so consciously assume that the institutions of state would just fall in line and get to the point where they almost got over the line. In fact, they did in the sense that while the constitutional court didn't postpone the election till next year to make it much more convenient to the ANC, gave them the gap they were looking for. And I don't think it was intentional and I'm not purporting any motives, but all they needed was the small delay for the independent electoral commission to use that five days to claim that they had to reissue a timetable, reopen voter registration and allow the ANC to catch up with itself after they'd assumed that the election would be set back till February and it wasn't to allow them to catch up with themselves and register their candidates. And it's been quite extraordinary to watch that happen. Mm. Mm. Yeah, there is there is something to to the blatancy of it all, and I suppose I should say one of the reasons that I was excited to to call on you to see if you were available to speak was that um, I had disagreed with you uh, on Monday on the Daily Friend Show. Now let's just give the viewers some background. Last week, Friday, the Constitutional Court said you can't break the constitutional deadline. Uh, I think that was exactly right. That's uh, part of the reason the Institute of Race Relations went to the court. Uh, and of course, the DA was there as well, as were many other parties. But on Monday, the IEC said, well, we'll stick to that deadline, but we're going to break the deadline on candidate nominations. It's already open, uh, closed. It's going to reopen. Before they said that officially, Helen Ziller said this was going to happen. Uh, you said, uh, don't, <laughs> don't expect them to, to, to respect the deadline, don't expect them to respect the Constitutional Court's order to preserve the timetable uh, and, and only make those changes that are reasonably necessary uh, to, to deal with the, the registration of voters, which is another issue we'll get to. They're going to reopen the candidate list. That's exactly what the ANC wanted, and that's what the ANC is going to get. And I said, uh, with all due respect, Helen has Helen's lost it. This is just, this just can't be true. That would be too crazy. How could the IEC ever do that? It would be it would be a brazen act of partisan uh, betrayal of of its duty uh, to safeguard the freeness and fairness of this election. Um, okay, so I was wrong. You were right. Uh, but I think that some people might not understand why it's unfair. What is it that's unfair about shifting a deadline? Saying, okay, here's the deadline. Everyone meets the deadline, uh, accepting the ANC. And then you say, well, let's have another deadline. Um, I suppose at a theoretical and a practical level, it, isn't the new deadline also for everyone? So doesn't that make it fair? Well, in the run-up to an election, Gabriel, there are many, many deadlines. 
And they all have to be met so that the election can be held on the particular time. And working back from the deadline, the IEC sets various other deadlines. It's almost like the World Cup. They say kickoff is on the 5th of June, 2010. And then you work backwards from there and you realize when you have to put the first spade into the ground to, to turn the sod to build the stadium. So in the run up to a soccer World Cup, there must be thousands of deadlines. And if you want kickoff to be on the 5th of June, 2010, let's say it was back in the day, you have to meet all of those deadlines. Otherwise you're in big trouble. Now it's exactly the same with an election. It's a huge enterprise. And there are literally hundreds of political parties and they all have to meet various deadlines. There are deadlines for voter registration. There are deadlines for candidate registration. There are deadlines for the payment of your deposit. There are deadlines for the closing of the voters roll. There are deadlines for when you're allowed to advertise and when you have to stop campaigning. One after the other, it's a series of deadlines that you have to plan for. And in the past, it has been of the essence of having a free and fair election that everyone has to play by the same rules and meet the same deadlines. It's very much like putting in a tender for a bid that government puts out. If the deadline for submitting your tender is 5 p.m. in the afternoon, no one who comes at 5 past 5 or even one minute past 5 can be considered for that tender. That's how these rules work. It's the rule of law and due process. Now, it's always worked like that in the past. We've always known that. And in 2011, the IFP was disqualified in a whole range of municipalities because they missed the deadline for submitting their candidates' names. In 2016, the NFP was cancelled out of the whole election for missing a different deadline, which is the payment of their deposit. So they couldn't pay their deposit by the deadline even though all their candidates were nominated, even though they met every other deadline, they did not pay in time. And simply because of that, they were disqualified from the election as a whole. I remember in the critical 2006 election, when the DA in Cape Town was really gunning for the mayoralty, we got to remember on that very, very tenuous seven party coalition, but when we submitted our candidates by the deadline, there was one form we had filled in wrongly. And we appealed against the disallowing of that candidate whose form was filled in wrongly and we were dismissed. So we'd met the deadline, but one form out of the hundreds that we had to fill in wasn't filled in properly. And that candidate, it was in Ward 13 in Cape Town, I'll never forget it, was disqualified. <laughs> And when every vote counts, you know how you feel when a mm. candidate in a vote rich ward gets disqualified. You feel absolutely terrible. So mm. everyone knows the rules of the game. They've never been any different for anybody. Mm. That's why everyone kills themselves to meet the deadline because you know that there's only one chance, mm. except when you're the ANC. The ANC was so sure that they would go get the election postponed till next year that they didn't put up a single registration poster for the registration, and lo and behold, the IEC canceled the registration in July. Okay, they used the excuse of COVID, but they canceled the registration in July. And the ANC before that hadn't put up a single poster, hadn't done a single thing, and I thought there's something very fishy going on here because the ANC must have known that there wasn't going to be a registration weekend. Hmm. And then they tried to use COVID, to postpone the election till next year. Now, obviously, the ANC doesn't want the election now. And frankly, it's got nothing to do with COVID. It's got everything to do with the fact that they've got no money, that they're at war with themselves when they opened their candidate selection process just the day before yesterday unlawfully because the, the deadline hasn't formally been shifted because we're challenging it it's in court. In the Northwest province, they started burning hospitals and hotels in the ANC's conflict around mm. the candidate selection process. Mm. And when mm. you're in a country where the burning down of hotels and hospitals doesn't make the news anymore, because mm. it's the ANC's election contest, 
then you know what kind of state the ANC is. That's not newsworthy anymore. So the ANC is deeply divided. They've just had the uprising in KwaZulu-Natal and parts of Gauteng. And the bottom line is they can't run an election. Their staff are on strike. They just haven't got the wherewithal. So they thought they could manipulate state institutions to get the election at a time of their choice. Now, when they missed the deadline for submitting all their candidates in 93 municipalities, I mean, you've got to be spectacularly bad to do that. <laughs> 93 municipalities. They wanted to appeal to the electoral court. And they spent a lot of money and a lot of time, money they don't have, putting together an appeal to the electoral court. They put it in on the Monday morning and they withdrew it on the Monday afternoon, saying they decided to wait for the constitutional court judgment. Now, surely anybody with half a brain asks why? Why? What do they know about the constitutional court judgment that no one else knows? And my immediate thought was, well, they know there's going to be a postponement, which is all they want, so they can reopen the timetable so they, they can resubmit their candidates. And I speculated about that, and there was all hell broke loose, as usual, whenever I do any analysis, even though several other people made the same conclusion and joined the mm. same dots. Nevertheless, be that as it may, while the Constitutional Court held firm and said the constitutional deadline is the constitutional deadline, as indeed they should have done, and as indeed they did, they basically said, you've got a five-day window of opportunity till the 1st of November when the final deadline runs out. And so what the IEC did was fine. Five days is fine. And then we will just reopen the timetable, issue a new timetable, and allow the ANC to re-register its candidates. And why is everybody else complaining? Because you could also re-register your candidates. Well, sorry, but we already registered our candidates by the deadline. And the... Concord said you can only change the deadlines that are relevant to voter registration, because you will remember that the IEC cancelled the voter registration, the only voter registration that was going to be held on the 16th and 17th of July because of COVID. So the Concord said if you're going to have a free and fair election, you have to allow voters to register. About 9 million people have, are either first-time voters or have moved house since the last election. So you've got to let them register. And you can only change the timetable to the extent that it impacts on voter registration. Candidate registration was closed, but the IEC found an ingenious way of claiming that voter registration was linked to candidate registration and therefore reopened candidate registration. And that was all the ANC wanted, working with the IEC to get it and using the gap opened by the Constitutional Court unwittingly. Okay, well, let's jump in there, um, because I'm not sure I, I I fully agree with that last bit, but let's talk about the... the I, I do think that the IEC has tried something. Uh, you, you say ingenious. Uh, let's unpack that. So the IEC's argument is that... Uh, I mean, sorry, not the IEC, so Ramaphosa, our president, he said there's an inextricable link uh, between voter registration and candidate nomination, and he finds that in section uh, 19 uh, of the Bill of Rights, uh, which speaks to the rights not only to vote for office, but the right to run for office. And the IEC has unpacked that argument to say the following. The age of majority comes along, let's say, October 20, August 24th, 2021. Someone turns 18. So, the candidate list has been closed on August 23rd. So they can't be a candidate because they couldn't have been a registered voter. And now the registration is opening for voting on September 18th and 19th. So they'll be able to register to vote in an election that they can't run in. And this breaks the inextricable link uh, that the Bill of Rights guarantees between running and voting in elections. And therefore, since the usual course of things in the Municipal Electoral Act says first you close voter registration, then you close candidate nomination, if you're going to reopen voter registration, you must reopen candidate nomination. And the Constitutional Court could have no argument against that. No one could have any argument against that. And that is what we must do. That's what makes this case different to 2016 uh, with the NFP and 2011 with the IFP. What, what do you make of that, that line of reasoning? Well, I think that is disingenuous because you can register to vote before you turned 18. 
And throughout this whole period, you could have registered online. The voters roll closed on the 3rd of August when Dr. Glamini Zuma proclaimed the election. That was when the voters roll closed. But anyone could have registered up till that date. And certainly if they were going to be a candidate or if they even thought of being a candidate, they would have made sure that they registered because otherwise they couldn't have been a candidate. Now, if the voters roll has closed when the election is proclaimed, it is quite obvious that anybody who turns 17 or 18 after that has missed their chance in that round. There are always going to be people who miss their chance because of a birthday, but there's always going to be a deadline for candidate nomination and voter registration. Now, anyone who's about to turn 18 and wanted to stand for election could have registered when they were 17 going on 18. They can only vote when they're 18. Now, online registrations have been possible all the way through, and online registrations are still possible. The only question is which online registrations are going to be recognized. When the date was proclaimed as the 3rd of August, only the registrations up to the 3rd of August will be registered. I mean, will be, will be on the voters roll. That's the critical thing. And now that Nkosazana Glamini Zuma has re-proclaimed or will re-proclaim and gazette the election, the voters' roll will close after the voters' registration weekend on the 19th of September. So the issue here is that anyone could have registered, and if they're wanting to stand, would have registered, and if they registered after the 3rd of August, it will now be recognized. So they could have been a candidate. So I don't yeah. really buy that argument at all. I, I agree with that, and I'd like to just supplement it with, with, a, with a discovery. I had no idea about this, but you can register from the age of 16. You mm. can't then vote until you're 18, but you can register from when you're 16. I also supplemented with this because we at the IRL were extraordinarily disturbed by Dlamini Zuma's uh, premature proclamation and the effective disenfranchisement of, of decent South African voters that that achieved. And then there was a bit of a counter-argument, well, anyone could have used the online platform uh, before August 3rd. So is she really disenfranchising anyone? Yes, she was, because you can't expect ordinary South Africans to use the online platform, uh, data being what it is and internet distribution being what it is. And yes, there was an option to go into your local municipal office, but you can't expect every South African to do that either. People had an expectation of an in-person voter registration weekend, That's transport money, data money, those things kind of matter, not knowing what's really going on, relying on uh, huge public relations campaigns to tell you what's going on. That applies to the ordinary grassroots voter, but it does not apply to the prospective candidate. The prospective candidate can't plead poverty on not having enough data because there's a fee you have to pay to get onto the list to make sure that people are serious about it. Also, you can't plead ignorance uh, because you didn't know because a candidate for office has surely got to know what the proper procedure is. And that you, you combine those two things with all the things you already said. And I do think this age of majority argument really blows out of the water. But on top of that, uh, and, and I, I refer here to our, our, our producer, Nicholas Lorimer, who was a ward councillor for the DA. Um, he couldn't think of anyone uh, below the age of 20 uh, that had been a ward councillor that he knew of. And we looked on the IEC's website and they break down ward councillors. They have zero on record uh, below the age of 20. Uh, so this also seems like just a figment of the imagination rather than a practical issue. Well, that's why I say it's disingenuous. I mean, there is a principle involved. Anybody over the age of 18 who is a voter should be able to stand as a candidate, but no one was blocked from standing as a candidate. Absolutely nobody. And in fact, if they registered after the 3rd of August, they will now be recognized. You could put your name in as a candidate. You could put your name as an, in as a candidate without being registered as a voter. And that throws it up as an exception on the IEC system. And the minute you register as a voter, it becomes regularized. Mm. So no mm. one has been excluded in this way. No one at mm -hmm. all. That's why I say it's a disingenuous argument. But I knew mm -hmm. it would happen. I absolutely knew. 
The ANC was so confident that they wouldn't have to fight an election this year. But mm. all they needed was that tiny little gap that allowed them to worm through to get the candidates registered. Okay, so there I think we agree. Here's where I think we disagree, Helen, which is that I don't believe that the that the Constitutional Court wittingly or unwittingly opened the door for the IEC to do this whatsoever. Firstly, the Concord did know about this argument. There are direct references to this argument both being presented to the court. By this argument, I mean the Concord was presented with a problem. The, the premature proclamation did disenfranchise South Africans. So they had to erase that. They had to undo that somehow. But then they were afraid that if they undid that by canceling the whole thing and starting the whole process, registration, candidate nomination, securing of venues, everything from the beginning all over again, then just as a practical matter, we wouldn't be able to stick to the November 1st deadline. So the Concord sits with a problem that it often sits with which is a law or an order, a regulation, government action, that's unconstitutional and invalid, but only in part. And so it wants to take a scalpel and remove that part rather than strike the whole thing down, burn the whole forest to get rid of the bad seed. And then things are also pretty bad because you're left with the with a sort of nullity, a kind of uh, uh, a vacuum of, of rules and regulations of what to do. And they were told, if you cancel this proclamation, you might put us in this position where the IEC then goes and reopens candidate lists and, and that would be problematic from a practical point of view. And they therefore addressed this concern in my reading quite explicitly by saying, hey, you must do, as you say, you must uh, uh, be allowed to shift the date if need be to the final November 1st deadline. That way, if you need a few extra days, you've got those few extra days. So that's one thing that you're allowed to change from October 27 to November 1st. And the other thing that you must change is you must reopen the voters' roll. And you must make any electoral timetable adjustments needed reasonably necessary to do that. But other than that, you must preserve the timetable. And if you've got any doubt about in your mind about what that means for candidate nominations, please look at what we've said to the EFF, which is you cannot extend the deadline. The EFF asked for that, and the court says, no, that is dismissed. To my mind, that leaves no room for interpretation, Helen. The court has not allowed the IEC to do this. The IEC is just taking a chance, pretending that it can't read the law or it can't read English uh, to invent uh, an excuse to do absolutely what the ANC wanted and, and what no one else wanted. I mean, you guys are opposing it. The EFF has spoken out against this. I see the IFP has just filed papers also to the, uh, oppose the IEC. Uh, no one but the ANC really likes what's happening here. Um, but I don't. I, I just disagree with you that the Concord has made any room for it. What do you say? To well, that? let me tell you why I disagree with you. First of all, let's start with where I do agree with you. The IEC, in their papers to the Concord, asking for a postponement till February, hoist itself by its own petard by saying that they couldn't possibly do all these things by the deadline including opening the candidates list again, including all of these things. They said, we can't do any of that. We will miss the deadline. So we can't hold a free and fair election before the end of the deadline, which is the 1st of November. So you've please got to postpone it. The Constitutional Court said, no, you have to. That's your job. You've only got one job, and that's to hold a free and fair election by the deadline. So you have to do that. But to help you along, we will say that the only thing you need to hold is a voter registration weekend. And you don't have to change any other part of the calendar or the deadline or the timetable. You can just do one thing, and that is voter registration. And you'd said before that you would be able to do voter registration on the 18th and the 19th of September. So that's what's going to happen. So then, yeah. Well, the A, yes, absolutely, that's what happened. Now, the ANC didn't get its first prize and the IEC didn't get its first prize, which was an election next year, but they got enough of a prize. They got a postponement of five days. And that was quite enough for the IEC to forget about its entire argument before the Constitutional Court and say five days is enough. We will say that we have to redo the entire timetable, although we swore blind before the Constitutional Court we couldn't do it, 
But we've just got five days and we will now redo the entire timetable because we will make this tenuous and irrational connection between anyone who might register to vote and who might want to be a candidate. Hmm. That's what happened. Mm -hmm. And no one has yet explained to me why the ANC withdrew its case to the electoral court. Unless it knew that there would be even a tiny sliver of an opportunity to get its candidates registered without having to go to the electoral court, because they would have lost in the electoral court because of precedent. Mm -hmm. so I can quite imagine that the IEC said to them, don't go to the electoral court. There's all this precedent where everybody, where everybody has appealed against missing deadlines. I don't know what is wrong with my computer. It's not charging for some reason. I wonder if it is now. No um, worries. We hear you okay. loud. Yeah. Okay, good. So basically saying you'll never win in the electoral court. There's too much precedent that is against you. And um, rather wait, because the minute there is the tiniest sliver of a space, we will make sure we redo the timetable and allow you to register your candidates. That is the only thing that could have happened. Okay, so so let's break apart those two points. I just want to ask Nicholas uh, if you can uh, bring up the the image of the IEC's answering affidavit, uh, in which it was it was confronted uh, by this question: uh, Could you go ahead and tinker with the timetable uh, in such a fashion that allows the the kind of scalpel treatment uh, that I was describing? Could the constitutional court say, look, we're going to keep everything as it is. We're just going to change the voters' registration and, we, and we're going to keep going. Then, on, Secondly, uh, could we start the whole thing over? And the IEC's response was, and, and still have the election in time, by the way. Sorry, that's the important bit. And the, I, the IEC said, no, we can't do that. And then it was asked to focus just on the question of extending candidate nomination. Could you please do that? And this it was asked to do, again, by the EFF, who said, look, we're fine with postponing the whole election. We'd prefer it to be in 2022. But if it can't be in 2022, please, can we at least extend the candidate nomination process so that we can have some rallies, so that we can do this, so that we can do that, for whatever reason. We want that process to extend. And the IEC said, no, you can never do that and still have the election by November 1st. And I do want to read this out because this is sworn before the Constitutional Court, the IEC says the com an extension to the candidate nomination cutoff date would require extensions of related subsequent steps. This is what Helen was saying about the timetables, the deadlines for building a stadium for the World Cup, and ultimately reduce the period for preparing and distributing the, the ward ballots and proportional representation ballots. They have to print out nearly 10,000 ballots that are all different with different ward councillors' names and different party lists in all of the different wards. The logistics of this task are already tight under a six-week time frame. The relief sought by the EFF would significantly reduce the available time. It requires the following. The court must deliver its order. The minister must then, within a week, uh, promulgate the regulations to permit gatherings. The commission must then determine a date for the final submission of nomination lists that is consistent and accommodative of the purpose of enabling affected political parties to complete their nomination lists. The commission must therefore set an extension that is reasonably capable of achieving this purpose. It could not be less than two weeks. So it would have to wait another two weeks, and this is moot because that's not the world we're in. But the point is, it says if it had to delay, it would be left with two weeks and it would be impossible for it to then print out the ballots. It says it's not possible that this relief can be achieved without an extension of the present timetable by at least four weeks, if not more. It's saying it needs at least a month after the candidate process has been completed to go ahead with election. The result would be that the commission would only be in a uh, position to prepare the ballots for four, for all for 4,000 wards, 205 municipalities, 44 district municipalities, and then distribute them to over 23,000 polling stations two weeks before the local government elections. This is an impossible feat. The commission submits that the impossibility of this relief further supports its submission that you've got to postpone the election. Now, if we just come back to the real world that we are in. Gosh, my, my whole thing is... My my charger, my, my thing's not charging. I'm very sorry. All right, let's just try and see. Okay, keep going. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Yeah. In the real world, Dlamini Zuma will only be able to proclaim after 
after uh, September 19th, so September 20th. And then there's a process where once the candidate list nominations are up, they have to be vetted, they have to be checked before they can be certified. The IEC has said you can't do that in less than a couple of weeks. That takes you into October, at least into October 7. But then it says you need at least a month to go from there to printing all the ballots, distributing it, and pulling off the election, which takes us past November 1st. So the IEC swore to the courts that it cannot do what it's now saying it can absolutely do. So, I mean, I think that everyone in South Africa should kind of spare a mind for the IEC's lawyers because they've had to sign on to this. Uh, Glenn Machini, the, the chairman of the IEC, has had to swear to this. And now the Constitutional Court has heard what the DA had to say, is seeing the IFP's papers, and has instructed only a couple of hours ago the IEC to answer the case that it's saying it can now do what it previously said is impossible, that it's going against the Constitutional Court's own order, that it's making to break the freeness and fairness of this election. And it has to do all of that by noon Monday. So I really look forward to seeing how they try and square the circle on this. Uh, but I think it's extraordinary on the one hand to go from saying this to now telling the country, no, we can do it, no problem. That's the first part of what Helen was addressing. The second part is the ANC's double take. And Nick, if you can pop us, pop just back to us. I'd like to uh, remind people what Jesse Duarte said when the IEC uh, closed the deadline on October, on August 23rd for candidate nominations. She said, and I quote, this prejudice to the ANC, which hadn't been able to complete its lists, as the largest party is manifest, and if the situation is not rectified, the election is not free and fair. Jesse Duarte directly accused the IEC of prejudice against the ANC. Why? Duarte explained that the ANC had not been able to complete its lists because the IEC's internet had been failing, because the IEC's process was irregular and prejudicial. Then, when the, when the ANC is getting what it wants, Duarte completely changed uh, her, just to quote her explanation, so you know I'm not making it up, Duarte said, first, the IEC system repeatedly flows and locked our administrators out during the final few hours before the deadline. Data already entered was voided and had to be re-entered. <sighs> this is not good. She changes her mind later and says, whatever happened, we cannot blame the IEC. We do know that. We were late. She goes from saying it's all the IEC's fault and this is prejudice to saying, no, this is all the ANC's fault and the IEC is perfect. This is, is this an insult to my intelligence or have, have I lost touch with reality? Can you possibly have it both ways? Well, you haven't lost touch with reality. The reality is that the IEC is a captured institution. And I have absolutely no doubt that the IEC and the ANC discussed the ANC's dilemma of not having submitted its candidates list. And the ANC knew absolutely that if it went to the electoral court, the weight of precedent would be just too momentous. It could never get that through the electoral court. So all the IEC needed was the smallest possible postponement. And they didn't mind going back on everything they'd said under sworn affidavit before the Concord trying to get the election postponed till next year. They just said to the ANC, the minute we get the smallest postponement, we will absolutely reissue a timetable from the beginning and you'll be able to submit your candidates. And you scratch our back, I scratch your back, that's how it works. And then suddenly Jesse turns out and says, no, the IC is very good after all. And it was our fault, not yours. That's how it works. And when I said that, I got absolutely hammered from all sides, but um, that's fine. I know the ANC, I know my customers. Okay, so I, I'd like to ask, I, I think that, I mean, what, what, what you're laying at our feet is a very serious charge. And, mm -hmm. and I'd like people to just watch this clip, Nicholas, uh, because this all starts to my mind. I mean, not the whole story uh, of, 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 of challenges uh, with IEC credibility, 
But really something very poisonous is planted in this electoral cycle on August 3rd, when Nkosa Zanat Lamini Zuma proclaims the election before the promised registration for October 27th instead of November 1st, which we'd already asked in letters for her to consider doing, because then there wouldn't have been this opportunity and there would have been maximum time in between. She proclaims prematurely in this double sense. And why? Why does she say she did this? Uh, Nick, can you, can you play the clip there? A request for the postponement for an election that has not been proclaimed. So the election must be proclaimed. The IEC will then say it's asking for postponement for those elections that have been pro proclaimed. Okay. Thank you, Nicholas. The first little bit got lost there, but what she said was the IEC cannot go to court to ask for a postponement for an election that has not been proclaimed. Correct. So therefore, we must proclaim, <laughs> and so then they can go to court. Exactly. And, and I watched everyone. Everyone, everyone swallowed point. that. Everyone, everyone swallowed believed it. it. But well, was it ever true? Well, it was true because the ANC wanted a postponement, and the advice was that you can't postpone an election that hasn't been proclaimed. So you can go and ask for the proclamation to be null and void because you cannot hold a free and fair election within that time frame. So I, I want to jump in there. I want to jump in there and disagree, because we have seen court papers that show that Lamini Zuma, her legal team, told her that this isn't true. She spoke to the IEC, and the IEC's legal team and her own legal advisor said, look, that is not true. The IEC's problem is that it says it can't hold an election at any time before November 1st. So it doesn't need a particular date. It just needs the fact that there's a window of 90 days provided by the constitution. And there's a report from the IEC, which says they can't have an election at any time in the 90 days. That's what gave them locus standi to go to the constitutional court. Now, the report was irrational in its judgment, uh, and that's why the Concord had to ultimately rule against it. But Klamini Zuma was told by her legal advisors that this was not true, and she believed it, her, her reply indicates this, and her own legal representatives, her counsel before the Constitutional Court, said that she knew this to be a false argument and that she believed what her legal advisors had told her. And, and, and her, her counsel had to say this precisely to try and dodge the accusation that you're laying, but through a different channel, to say you can't blame Glamini Zuma for, for deliberately screwing things up in order to allow the IEC to go to court because she'd been told that they could go to court anyway. So they're attributing the motive to her or, or the knowledge and the understanding that what she just said was a lie. But it doesn't get her off the deeper charge which you're laying at her feet, which is namely that she is screwing up the process, not so that they can go to court, they could go to court anyway, but so that they have a stronger argument when they're in court to say that it'll be very difficult to have this free and fair election. Please, everything is complicated and it's challenging and it's hard to think about. It'll all be easier if we just ignore the constitution and have this election in 2022 or 2023 or 2024 when it suits the ANC much better. So this to me is the, is, it's, it's, it's the grandest lie in this electoral cycle. And what really disturbs me is that the IEC knew that she was lying because they had the letters from her saying, no, I've got the legal advice, I understand it. And they didn't challenge her. And it's the first indication of, of several, but it's such a clear indication of the servant and the master relationship, not being between the IEC and parliament and the people and the credibility of our elections, but rather being between the IEC uh, and an ANC member acting unconstitutionally, demonstrably so according to the court itself. So this, this kind of freaks me out. And then we get into other lies uh, or, 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 or misrepresentations. First, you have, you have ANC spokesperson Pule Mabe saying uh, that, no, our issue was never the candidate postponements. We were never worried about that uh, once the constitutional court judgment comes out. But of course, the ANC court papers show that that was one of the reasons that they were going to court was one of the things that they were seeking. And as you say, they went to the electoral court before mysteriously withdrawing it. So they completely changed their tune. Also, you have Jesse Duarte saying, 
No, we never asked for the deadline to be extended. When the ANC not only asked for the deadline to be extended, they asked for the deadline to be extended beyond the IEC's request. The IEC said, can we do it till February? The ANC said, we can do it until April. April. Mm-hmm. Now, here's my, here's my concern, Helen. There's such a thing as, as sort of straightforward lying, which is when you know what you're saying is not true. And, and, and that's just clear as day to me what happened with Lamini Zuma in that clip that I just showed you and other instances. But then there's something else where, where lying does involve trying to convince other people that something's not true, that something is true even when it's not. But that can't be entirely what's going on here because the lies are so obvious. So I think some people are going to be persuaded. Some people are going to be carried along. But I think some people are just going to be confused. Some people are just going to get kind of angry and ultimately frustrated with the system itself. And and I do see analogs of, of what happened in America towards the end of last year, a sort of crisis of faith in the democratic process itself. And I worry about South Africa. You know, I worry about the political contest. But I also worry about the competition between democracy and authoritarianism. And if you don't believe in this election for one reason or another, can we really hold on to the democratic system that we need to 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 keep the powerful serving the people and not the other way around? Well, they haven't done that for a very, very long time. And they won't in a so-called democracy where people don't boot out power abusers from office. That just won't happen. But let, and that's why these elections are so important. They really are. And the polling tells us that the ANC is going to fall below 50%, which makes it a game changer election and which makes it really, really important that everybody goes and registers so that they can vote. And there's another fantastic opportunity now to go and register if you're not registered and get it done so that you can vote because every single vote is going to count. But let me go back to Dlamini Zuma. We spoke to our lawyers about it and we said, is she lying or is she not? Because that proclamation took us all hugely by surprise because on proclamation, the voters roll closes. And once the Mm -hmm. voters roll closes, it has big implications. That is a deadline for the closing of the voters roll. And our lawyers said to us, if they did not proclaim the election, they would have assumed in going to the constitutional court that the Constitutional Court would automatically grant an extension. And if they simply assumed in their actions that the Constitutional Court would do the ANC's bidding, that would be contempt for the Constitutional Court from the start, and they could expect a massive backlash. So they thought if they simply go into it and say, well, we haven't proclaimed because we can't hold the election because it's not possible, so you have to grant us uh, an extension beyond the constitutional deadline, then it would have been in utmost bad faith and Mm -hmm. it would have turned the constitutional court into just a rubber stamp. So her advice was you have to proclaim the election now. That's part of the timetable that you have to meet. And you can only ask the court the Constitutional Court, to declare that proclamation null and void if you've made that proclamation and not simply assumed that the court will automatically extend the deadline. That was the logic. And so while I am very suspicious of the ANC on just about everything, I could understand Lamini Zuma's logic on that particular one. Okay, let me push back against that. So here's, I agree, you're absolutely right, that if if, if Lamini Zuma had said, no, I'm not going to proclaim at all. If today she still hadn't proclaimed, we get to court at the end of August, she still hasn't proclaimed. That would be, that would be contemptuous. That would, that would be preempting the court in the most brazen, obvious way. But that's not the only option, right? So there is such a thing. What's the story with that little uh, girl in the fairy tale who goes into the bear's house and the one kind of porridge is too hot (laughs) and the other kind of porridge is too cold. It's a Goldilocks thing. Too early, terrible, because you're disenfranchising people. Too late, or not at all, terrible, because you're, you're, you're basically preventing the timetable from being created, which, which effectively creates a break of the deadline. But there was a Goldilocks zone that she could have and would have hit if she wanted to, and that is to have waited a week. We should have had an election 
registration weekend on the 31st of July, 1st of August. That was scheduled. Now, the IEC hasn't been able to explain why that didn't happen. It said, well, we can't have one during level four, but that was during level three. Then it said, well, it was only five days into level three and it was still kind of confusing. Well, if you're going to plead confusion, then you can surely do it the next week, the first week of August. And if they had done it on the 6th and 7th or 7th of 8th of August or whatever it is, and Lamini Zuma had proclaimed on the 9th, that would still have left more than 83 days. And the IEC had said, we need 83 days between proclamation and the election date. So there was a Goldilocks zone. It was right there staring in front of her. And there's no way she couldn't have known it. So while she was right to say she had to proclaim, in order not to be contemptuous of the court. She was wrong to say she had to proclaim on August 3rd. And that's okay, the whole point. That. It's the I date that point the entirely. Okay, but I get that point entirely, but let me then just argue why she did it. Mm -hmm. She did it then because it was before the voter registration. Mm. She did it deliberately because it was before the voter registration. And she knew that no court in South Africa could say that you could hold a free and fair election which effectively disenfranchises 9 million people who are waiting for a voter registration weekend, either to re-register because they've moved in the meantime or to register for the first time. So she absolutely knew that the court could not allow an election to be held without a voter re registration weekend. So if she proclaimed on the 3rd and closed the voters roll, they, couldn't, they would have to change things so that you could have a voter registration. And it was that voter registration and that change in timetable and that gap that the IEC needed to manipulate a reopening of the candidate registration. Mm -hmm. All right, you see, now we're on the same page. I, I fully agree with that. And I think that is... Except they hadn't missed the <laughs> deadline by then. That's what we have to remember. They hadn't missed yes. the deadline by then. But they probably knew they would. They said that they would. They said that they couldn't, they, they swore to the court. In fact, they said that things would be worse than they were. They said they wouldn't be able to get a single nomination in on time. And then they managed to get most of their nominations in on time, but not except all. 93, except in 93 municipalities out of 268. That's quite yeah, a high percentage. And not a, single, not a single PR list councillor in the Western Cape. And not a single PR councillor in most of KwaZulu-Natal. Yeah, no, it's 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 wild. I think that, do you, what do you, let's walk down a couple of scenarios, I think, I, I think to draw ourselves, um, to draw ourselves to the hour and a conclusion here. The, the ANC wins uh, its battle, sorry, the IEC uh, wins, it's hard to tell sometimes the difference, wins the battle at the <laughs> Constitutional Court uh, and and the court says, look, this is not really what we envisaged, uh, uh, but it's we don't want to mess with this any more than we already have. Please just go ahead, reopen the candidate nominations, whatever. Just leave us alone. Go ahead, do the election. Does the ANC, if it gets all the lists full up, does it does it hold on to uh, fifty percent nationwide? Does it hold on to the metros? Does it hold on to KZN? Has it been rolling out? Um, the kind of campaign uh, that you think is 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 going to boost it up. In other words, is is this court battle what's going to make the difference between the ANC losing big time and actually winning big time? That's my first question. The sort of well, the sunny be, side scenario for the ANC. Well, it it will make a difference, obviously a huge difference, but it won't change the fact that the ANC is bankrupt. It won't change the fact that it's got a massively inflated but also hugely alienated workforce. It won't change the fact that they haven't got an election strategy or a plan or a manifesto or anything, and the election is in seven weeks. The ANC was so confident that they could get it postponed till next year that they did nothing. There was no planning, no organization. The DA, on the other hand, said, we don't know whether this election is going to be in October or February or April or next October, but we better damn well be ready by the very first date that it can be because we don't want to be caught with our pants down. 
And so we did all the planning and we got everything together. We've got all our posters printed, all our pamphlets done, everything. So the ANC has got nothing done. Now, they're going to have to hold an election, but the very least they want is to get their candidate list in. So let's say the ANC can't put up a single PR candidate in the Western Cape because the window isn't reopened for them. That effectively drives them as a party out of the Western Cape. They'll win a few wards across the province. Yes, they will. And they'll win quite a number of wards in, in key areas. But not to have a single PR seat reduces you to a tiny marginal party in the Western Cape. In KwaZulu-Natal, which is normally their heartland, now we see Jacob Zuma has been released to pacify the KwaZulu-Natal vote for the ANC, but not to have a single PR candidate in all of KwaZulu-Natal except three municipalities takes out their heartland. It is an extraordinary shift. So you can understand why they are so damn desperate to have that window reopened. Now, it's an open question, Gabriel, as to whether this is going back to the Concord, because we've challenged the reopening of the candidate nomination deadline. Will it go to the Concord or will it go to the Electoral Court? Now, I'm prepared to bet, and again, this is speculation, and people go into hysterics when I speculate. Everyone else is allowed to speculate, but apparently I'm not. So everybody, this is speculation. And my speculation is this. The INC, IC and the ANC knew that they were skating on very thin ice. But they said, we'll do it anyway, because the second case will be heard by the electoral court, not the constitutional court. And there's no precedent on the reopening of voter registration after candidate registration has been closed. Helen, I can't let you go on. This is I, I, all, as much as I want to, because we've seen, uh, we've just seen just before our, our conversation started, the Constitutional Court sent out instructions saying that uh, we, 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 we want to hear the matter from the IEC. So okay, whether so the court hears it in, in, in open oral argument or whether it just consults papers, it has effectively shut down the route okay, for the electoral court, which is extremely well, good. good. So just to explain that scenario, okay, okay, it would have been um, terrible. If it had gone to the electoral court, it would have been confusing. Uh, it would have well, delayed the process the even court, further. The ANC might well have won. Yes, exactly. If they'd gone to the electoral court, which was the plan, the ANC might yes. well have won. But yes. I'm not quite as up to date on the latest thing because I've been working right up till now. It must have come through you, quite early. With, but that's very it, good it, news. It, Yes, that's very good news. Why did I'm the IEC say they couldn't couldn't do all of those things? And the constitutional court said, "You said you swore blind, you couldn't do any of these things. Now you can. Could you please explain what has changed?" Yes, but you see, it's, that's what I've been asking all the time. What has changed? Hmm. The ANC goes to the electoral court, they withdraw. What changed? And so we go down the road because they make a plan, and then they see another way. And they get out of the road that they've started on, but they never explain what they're doing. And that leaves the way open for a lot of speculation. And as I say, I have known the ANC for a very, very, very long time, since I was an activist in the 1980s. Mm. And I'm not surprised at anything anymore. Mm. Mm. Okay, so so let's let's go down the route where 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 the IEC doesn't win here, where the Concord says, look, you guys have to tell us by Monday what's changed your mind. Firstly, how come you said this was impossible? Now you're saying that this is really easy to do. Secondly, what is your majority, age of majority, 18 years old? Can you put that argument on paper and swear to it? And then the chief justices of the apex court can consider that in light of other facts like you can register when you're 16 uh, and so on. Let's let's see this on paper. Let's see how it really looks when you're not sort of sitting in a, in a newsroom and, and kind of waffling away and hiding the ridiculousness and verbiage. Let's see it properly. Concord looks at that and says, no, these guys have misinterpreted our order. Uh, when we gave that extension from 27 October to 1 November, we were not saying you can do whatever else you'd like. Uh, when we said reopen the voter registration, we were not saying do whatever you like. 
we said exactly what we meant. And that was, you can make those two changes and you can do anything that allows those two changes, but no more than that. And in particular, when we said you can't extend the candidate deadline to the EFF, what we meant was you can't extend the candidate deadline, full stop. Let's say the Concord says that. Now the ANC is sitting in a position where it doesn't have candidates in 93 wards. Some candidates, but some candidates are missing. 93 in, municipalities. In, sorry, in 90 municipalities, in about a third of the municipalities, it's missing some, uh, some, some, some lists. Well, then this is definitely a change election. Um, that will be good for opposition parties. Uh, it will be good for the DA. I'm sure it'll be good for the EFF. I'm sure it'll be good for the IFP and so on down the line. How does that change South African politics? Of course, you'll tell us that where the DA gets in charge, it'll be able to administer better than everyone else. And I take that on the back of evidence that I've seen as someone who's not uh, connected to any of the parties to be likely, most likely, and predictably true. Um, uh, but beyond that, how do you think South Africa's politics changes if, we, if we're sitting in a world where the balance of forces, as the ANC likes to refer to it, really tilts away from this, this asymmetry where it's one big party and lots of little ones to, to, to something much more equal? Does that change how, how, how we think about politics? Um, and is it a good or a bad thing, I guess? Well, let me say this. Since 2014, when the EFF first bestrode the political stage in an election, I said the future of South African politics is the DA versus the EFF. The DA knows exactly what it stands for. We stand for constitutionalism, non-racialism, the rule of law. We stand for a market economy. We stand for individual freedom. We stand for a limited state whose role is to maximize individual opportunity and protect everybody's rights. That's what the DA stands for in a nutshell. The EFF also knows exactly what they stand for. They stand for racial nationalism. They stand for socialism. They stand for the party controlling the state and the state controlling society. They stand for some people and see other people as the enemy of the majority. And they also know exactly what they stand for. The ANC hasn't got a clue. Part of the ANC would be with us and a, another part would be with the EFF. And so that party is so ideologically inchoate that they would have to unravel. And that unraveling is what we're seeing now. This yeah. unraveling, the whole blow up in KwaZulu-Natal was a symptom of the ANC's unraveling. The crisis now in the Northwest province over Job Mahoro and his successor, all part of the ANC's unraveling. And this crisis over this election and the captured IEC trying to rescue the ANC is all part of the ANC's unraveling. Now, I really do hope, and I'm really thrilled to hear from you that the Concord will be seized with us because my great fear was that it would go to the electoral court and then the IEC might be able to make the argument to the electoral court that is uh, somewhat different. But if it's going to the Concord, and I'm not saying the electoral court's captured, not at all. They've been very, very strict on deadlines and other things. But if it goes to the Concord and the Concord said, you can't change your pleadings from one case to the next. I'm terribly sorry if you said two weeks ago or four weeks ago that it's impossible to open these um, deadlines, then you can't change your mind now if they can't provide a satisfactory explanation. So, you know, there's no doubt there was an attempt to do it, and there's no doubt that they thought the best pathway to it was to remove the appeal to the electoral court and wait for the Concord for the slightest, slightest delay in the timetable so that they could use that, except now they have to unravel their argument. But if they are hoist by their own petard or splashed by their own spittoon, well, so much the better. And I'm very much hoping that that will happen. Mm. Mm. I suppose part of the reason I asked that is because I think that we, we at the Institute like to talk about the Overton window, this concept that people sitting in a sitting in their private space look out into the public arena and, and you can't see everything because there's walls in the way. You can only see through the window. So you might not be able to see the tree of liberty and the fruit that it bears because the window is facing in another direction. And 
And this does seem to be the case that a lot of people uh, have thought that it's ANC or bust. A lot of people who voted ANC and then uh, felt uncomfortable with the ANC then decided not to vote. Uh, that that increasingly is the sort of the biggest vote. Now, surprisingly, South Africa, against every international trend, is is a country where, well, not every trend, but it, it's really dramatic here, where national voting has fallen uh, precipitately to sort of half the country not voting, whereas municipal government elections, participation has increased to the point where actually more people voted in the 2016 municipal elections than in the 2019 national elections. So municipal issues can drive and excite South Africans, and I think that is partly because of how grassroots our problems are, the, the, the broken holes in the road, the, the lights that don't turn on because the substation has been uh, vandalized and so on. And I do think that there's, there's something exciting about, to my mind, about South Africans giving up on the thought that we, we ought to be something like a one-party state, taking up the thought that we should be disagreeing about ideas and we should be trying out new things and really picking apart brick for brick the, the walls that are stopping us from seeing other options of how to go forward. And I think for people that are kind of sitting outside in the Garden of Liberty, it can be maddening. That's, that's where I think we work. And, and it can be maddening. Like, why do South Africans keep voting for the same party that produces outcomes that has 90% of South Africans, according to Ipsos, saying the country's going in the wrong direction, and not just now, for the last years and years and years. Why do we keep having that? It's not working, keep banging your head against the wall. To me, this seems like the election where maybe banging your head against the wall actually opens the wall and lets in the light to see that there are other ways forward. Um, and I think that's a very exciting prospect. So, so to all the to almost all the opposition parties, to all the opposition parties that are not punting uh, race, nationalist, socialism, and I think your assessment of the EFF is correct in that regard. I think this is a very exciting, a very exciting time. Um, so that's it from me. Uh, I, 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 I really want to thank you, and I, and I suppose as a parting shot, um, say that I'm that I'm impressed with the the DA's papers. Uh, we've we've read them in 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 its application to block the IEC's uh, uh, motion in this regard. Uh, from the IRR side, we we as an amicus, uh, we will be looking at what the IEC has to say in reply, what the ANC, which has also been called on to 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 answer the charge, to see what it says in reply, uh, and and we want to defend the process here. Uh, that's very important to us. And all the parties that have been keen on doing that, and the DA has been very good at that and, and has real resources to bring to bear in that front. Uh, it's very impressive, and I think that's very important work. Uh, so thank you for that, uh, and thank you so much for joining us uh, on, on, on this special edition of the show. Thanks very much, Gabriel. It's been great talking to you, as it usually is, and it's been great having this in-depth discussion. And all of these dots are often very difficult to join. And you have to join them and get the best picture you can through a glass darkly and through the Overton window and every other metaphor that you'd like to put together. <laughs> but the problem is that, you know, you can't work out what's going on sometimes. You just mm. cannot work out why this is happening, why that's happening, why this dot's here, why that dot's there. And then suddenly one or two more pieces of the puzzle fall in place. You think, aha, that's what's going on here. Sometimes you speculate, sometimes you get it right, sometimes you get it wrong, but I knew. I knew from the minute the ANC withdrew their case to the electoral court that they were banking on getting some kind of postponement. Mm. They were hoping for six months, eight months. They got five days, and that enabled the IEC to use it. But they might yeah. be caught up short now. I, I thought it was... Happened. I thought it was crazy, but you were right. You were absolutely right. I was wrong, and it's devastating. And I and I just hope that they get. Uh, I really hope that they don't get what what they're looking for in this case, because I think that oh, if they I. do, it's gonna it's gonna damage the system even further. It'll um, be but you see, we you know you have we have to expose. I do the job of the DA. It's to expose it. It's to fight it. It's to raise the money to do that. It's to take a stand against it and to take the flack of all these journalists who are five or ten years late with the trends. They don't see what's happening. They can't spot what's happening. Hmm. And then hmm. instead of asking the right questions, they go after me because I ask the questions. 
Yeah, no, it is it is amazing that other people can say exactly the same thing that you say uh, and get the inverse response. Um, but I do think that, yeah, I mean, okay, to, to take that line a step further, I, I do think that taking the flack is an important is an important concept and to do so um, to do so it, it, with the goal in mind of shedding light, of connecting dots. I, I think that there's something dramatic, almost cloying about the Washington Post slogan, democracy dies in darkness. But it is true. Uh, th this is exactly how people, wherever democracy has been given up on and kleptocratic autocracies have been taken up. It's been because people stop asking questions. They stop looking for evidence and they stop connecting those dots. And especially, uh, not everyone has the time to go out and, and, and find facts and uh, understand and analyze what's going on. So part of it is that people get lazy and part of it is that those who do have the time and who do know better stop saying so because they're afraid of taking the flack they're afraid of someone in the cocktail circuit or the or the or the sort of nighttime news circuit saying, "I don't know, aren't you being a little bit harsh?" And and well, for that's fear what they of don't say that they don't say that they say that on steroids. Well, I'm I am playing it down, <laughs> but I think no matter bad how no matter how bad those words are, it can't possibly be nearly as bad as what would happen to this country if if people didn't stand up and fight for the right to vote. I mean, it really is as simple as that. Completely. And then use that right sensibly. Anyway, we're out of time. I've got to be on something else at half past eight. So I want to thank very you very, good. very much. And I've got to very fix good. my computer. Yes. So it's great to see you. And it's great to see all the guys at the IRR. Give them all my love. Will do. I'll pass it along. And thank you so much for having us. Uh, yes. If you if you enjoyed this, uh, please check out The Daily Friend. Uh, we, we bring you news daily. Uh, Nicholas Lorimer, thank you so much for doing the goodies in the background. Uh, yeah, we, we, we're saving the vote here. We, we've gotten so far so good. Uh, we're hoping to win the next battle. And uh, yeah, once, once you've got the opportunity, use it wisely. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Bye.